James Gibson was inspired by William James, and his theories of perceptions are strongly influenced by his reaction against the behaviorists and cognitivists of his day. In short, behaviorists ignore the role of cognition, that all behavior is simply a product or reaction to our environment. Cognitivists advocate the opposite extreme, emphasizing an idealist understanding that mind is what's real. While this is a bit oversimplified, the key points to pay attention to are how Gibson's theory of affordances is an interactionist one, emphasizing the bond between a perceiver and the world perceived. But take note that Gibson undercuts this at the end of the article by stating that affordances are invariant. Let's take a closer look at his theory. For Gibson, the environment is comprised of surfaces that are distinguished from the medium in which we live, such as air or water. These surfaces portend offerings and opportunities, what Gibson terms affordances. When we perceive surfaces, they provide us with possibilities. So when I see the couch, it affords sitting. When I see the stove, it affords cooking. When I see a glass, it affords drinking. These values and meanings, according to Gibson, are direct. That is, they're not mediated by consciousness or mental activity. Moreover, they are external. That is, they are part of the perceived surfaces themselves. Surfaces contain all the affordances they offer to an animal, but they are related to the animal perceiving them. Thus, his interactionist point. A surface might afford jumping on by, say, a rabbit, such as a cardboard box, but it does not afford me the same offer. If I were to jump on this cardboard box, it would quickly crumble under my weight. This same cardboard box might afford chewing to the rabbit, but mailing a package for me. Thus, affordances are not just objective physical properties, that is, the characteristics that are constant, static, and true for anyone. Affordances are relative to the animal perceiving them, and these are not just animals in general or species specific, but individual as well. A spider might afford, afford fear for someone, but curiosity for another. It might afford stepping on or catching or ignoring, so it depends on the individual perceiving it. Note that affordances, the noun, is Gibson's novel term to describe the offerings of a perceived surface by an organism. These affordances are perceived by our senses, that is, visually, olfactory, tactile, auditorily, or gustatorily. Let's turn next to niches. Niches describe the environmental affordances that characterize the ways in which animals live. It's not quite habitats, which might describe the areas that animals live, that is where. Niches instead are the opportunities for different ways of life. As Gibson states, quote, a niche implies a kind of animal and the animal implies a kind of niche, end quote. This is a clear example of his interactionist understanding. Affordances and niches alike imply both the object and the animal. Let's consider an example. Soil affords digging by rabbits to create underground burrows. The same soil might afford planting vegetables to harvest, providing one with an agricultural way of life. Affordances occupy a space between objectivity and subjectivity. They are both, but neither physical or psychological. They are bound to the environment and the observer. They can't just be physical because they point to the opportunities given to the animal. And they can't just be psychological because they have to have certain physical properties that make the possibilities manifest that is possible. Soft, sandy soil wouldn't hold its shape. It would cave into itself. Hard, clay-like soil would be too tough to dig into. But these physical properties might lend themselves to other opportunities, even if the rabbit can't burrow into them to create an underground um, home. So these other opportunities, given different animals, afford different ways of living. Clay soil can't be dug through easily, so rabbits instead live in nests above ground, covered by the grasses that grow. 
it might afford a chance to cool off from the heat even. So the type of physical characteristics inherent in the object afford different opportunities for different animals, thus providing them with different niches. Now, affordances likewise occupy, occupy a space between objectivity and subjectivity. They are both but neither physical or psychological. They are objective in that they are facts of the environment. A hammer drives a nail into the wall, giving it strong uh, durability, and it provides enough force to push the nail into the wall in ways that, say, a cupcake just can't. A hammer affords hammering, but a cupcake does not. But these objective properties are not independent of the observer. Affordances are also subjective in that they are perceiver-specific. A hammer affords hammering by an organism that has opposable thumbs and can grasp the hammer to drive the nail through the wall. A hammer doesn't afford a rabbit hammering. They just can't grasp it, use it to drive a nail through the wall, much less wouldn't even have the idea in the first place. But subjective does not mean affordances reside in the mind, as idealists would posit. They can't just be physical because they point to the opportunities given to the animal, nor can they just be psychological because they must have certain physical properties that make the possibilities manifest. As Gibson states, affordances are relational, and his choice of terms here is meant to draw a clear line separating his theory from a dualist one. The mind versus body dilemma, where these two are clear and distinct independent entities, raises the questions of how a mind interacts with the body and how the body interacts with the mind. So for uh, example, these are questions that often plague dualists. They have to answer them. How do you account for how they relate to each other? It's assumed that mind and body are separate, independent, that is, they exist independently of each other and you can study one without studying the other. As relational, affordances instead only exist when one considers both the environment and the organism. In other words, you can't have one without the other. You must have the simultaneous presence of both in order for an affordance to be manifest. Indeed, this relational reality is manifest in all manner of psychological phenomena. As a living, breathing entity, we are constantly interacting with our environment. And to draw from Neiser, we are transformed by this interaction. While we can study each separately and independently, it is the reciprocal synergetic emergence of these relational aspects that are psychologically important. These relational aspects then apply a second entity pointing beyond themselves. Taking sensations as a case in point, our sight involves certain physical features of the environment pointing beyond itself. Yes, we can study the structure of the eye, the layers of the retina, and so on and so forth, but sight is relational. It's tied to the environment. To put it succinctly, without a lighted world, there would be nothing to see. We are only able to perceive certain wavelengths of light, thus limiting the range of light we can see. Any description of human vision necessarily implies a limited range of physical specifications of the environment. And that particular slice of the electromagnetic spectrum is important given that we humans can see it. Indeed, this slice is called visible light. Its name refers to its particular relationship and relevance to us. Gibson has great descriptions of the air as a medium that affords our breathing. The horizon stretches out before us across a flat earth, and no, not the conspiracy flat earth theory, but from the level of our situatedness here on earth, that is the ground upon which we stand. This is not Copernicus's earth. Our posture, standing on two feet, gives us height, affording us the ability to see quite a far distance. We'll return to this notion when we explore the body in our upright posture with a reading by Erwin Strauss. 
our perception of space, and here too not the abstracted XY Cartesian grid, but the Euclidean geometry of the world around us. We'll consider how linear perspective is not given to us, but learned. We must apprehend it as such. This is not immediately visible. We have to learn it. We'll consider a study that explores these differences in seeing two-dimensional objects as three-dimensional. Distances too are apprehended, obstacles versus openings. Vertical distances are much longer and farther than horizontal ones, and we'll look at these specifically in relation to our own bodies in a reading by Vandenberg. Gibson's notion of the furniture of the earth describes attached objects, those that can't be moved without breaking them, and these are distinguished from detached objects, those that can be grasped and moved by the hands. Graspability of objects is relational, given an organism that has appendages that can grab and offerings in the environment that can be grabbed. Objects that are too large or too heavy or that lack substance cannot be grasped. And these objects that we perceive, what do we notice about them? What exactly are we perceiving? For Gibson, we are perceiving affordances. What do these objects offer us? This immediacy, what he calls the direct perception of objects, is what Gibson says makes his theory an ecological one. The perception and sensation studies conducted by psychologists in a laboratory setting are abstract and unfamiliar. They are not the perception of daily life. Indeed, these studies have shown that we can detect a light bulb increasing in brightness. The just noticeable difference describes the minimum amount of change needed to detect a difference. But these are not the perceptions we notice in everyday life. Light affords seeing. Light could afford reading. Sure, we can distinguish between a bright white light and an amber light, but are these the properties and qualities that we first detect? Now, Gibson has a quote here that describes these orthodox psychological studies. He says, quote, psychologists assume that objects are composed of their qualities, but I now suggest that what we perceive when we look at objects are their affordances, not their qualities. He continues, the special combination of qualities into which an object can be analyzed is ordinarily not noticed, end quote. And one not need even know an object's classification, properties, or qualities to use it. Instead, its affordances are immediately perceived. It's important to note that what these traditional psychology studies, the psychometric ones, tell us is that we have this ability to detect qualities and properties, but it doesn't seem to afford us any ecological validity. That is, how do we perceive in an everyday context, in our everyday life? What are we perceiving? For Gibson, it's affordances. Objects are not comprised of these properties and qualities. Instead, this is not what makes that particular object distinguishable from another. We add those qualities after having perceived their affordances, their meaning, their value. So it matters not that a brick is made of stone and a hammer made of steel, nor one being a building material and the other a tool. A brick can afford me the same nail driving capabilities as a hammer. The qualities and properties of a brick and hammer can be discerned, certainly, but this is not what's perceived, at least not at first, not outside the laboratory setting. So what about the perceiver? Well, this is a really interesting idea. Affordances for Gibson are ultimately located, contained in, and held in the objects themselves. Gibson rejects the Cartesian dichotomy of subject and object, arguing that affordances are neither physical nor solely psychological. They belong neither to the realm of objective properties nor subjective val values. What, uh, Gibson, what Gibson neglects is the role of the perceiver, the animal perceiving, and this is not adding subjectivity to the equation here. A chair certainly has many affordances. It affords sitting, it affords standing, it affords a defense, it affords burning, it affords a place to hang a jacket, it affords innumerable possibilities. 
Yet, while Gibson acknowledges these are in relationship to the animal, the perceiver is not picking up these possibilities. That is, the perceiver is picking up these possibilities from the object itself. But the perceiver is not picking up these possibilities from the object itself. Indeed, the object shows itself as suitable or not suitable given a certain purpose, a certain project. A chair affords sitting when my project or goal is to rest. A chair affords burning when I need to build a fire to stay warm. A chair affords defense when I find myself in need of a weapon when I am under threat. A chair affords standing when I am in need of reaching higher than I stand on my tippy toes with my arms outstretched. These affordances appear in light of a project when a perceiver and object perceived meet, that is, in the encounter, affordances emerge. Affordances emerge and become manifest when an active perceiver seeks them out. The object affords possibilities, is meaningful, valuable, given a certain perspective, a certain project, a certain goal. The soil that we discussed earlier affords the possibility of digging when the goal is to create a shelter to hide or to rest in. It could afford a cool resting place when the sun makes the air insufferable. The affordances only appear to a perceiver who is actively seeking them out. The object affords possibilities for a perceiver who can possibilitize them. When Gibson describes how architects and designers know that glass affords seeing through but not passing through, and cloth affords going through but not seeing through, these are indeed possible affordances offered by glass and cloth, the objects themselves, but they are manifest given a purpose of constructing a barrier or divider one that suits one's goal of seeing through or passing through. The barrier or divider is implicit but equally important and bears being made explicit in Gibson's theory. It's why air won't do. Like glass, it too is see-throughable. If the see-through ability was the only affordance needed, glass and air would be equally suitable. The construction of a divider is the goal, and the divider must serve certain purposes and meet certain demands. It separates one space from another. But maybe privacy isn't a concern here. Maybe it protects something to be admired from afar, but not permit the viewer to get too close, like the glass case that protects the Mona Lisa. A cloth curtain wouldn't suffice here. To what end is being sought? These affordances appear out of a concern that we bring to the table. Now, Gibson addresses these concerns and acknowledges these values or needs that someone has by referencing the Gestalt psychologist who persisted, he claims, in the dualism of subject and object. Their argument, according to Gibson, was that objects were noticed or not depending on the needs of the observer, making distinctions between a physical object that is neutral and value-free and a phenomenal object that is valuable. Now, Gibson argues there is one object and the affordances may or may not be perceived, sure, depending on one's needs, but the affordances, Gibson claims, are invariant, always there. Regardless of an observer or not, the object has specific affordances. The affordances are not bestowed upon the object by the perceiver. It's already contained within the object, ready to be perceived. Indeed, Gibson states ambient light contains the information for the affordances of things. Sure, air affords breathing for a land animal, but it affords suffocating for a water-dwelling animal. Affordances do indeed point to both the perceived object and animal, but they are not contained in the object absent perceiver. Gibson claims that they are invariant, always there. But I would argue it takes an active perceiver to make them manifest, and herein lies the key. The affordance implicates a behavior, and a behavior united with an affordance together comprise an intentional act. 
The same cliff affords falling as it affords a launch pad for someone hang gliding. Both affordances are contained in the cliff according to Gibson, yet they are only made manifest, made known, only possib possibilitized by a perceiver who acts. The cliff affords falling for a perceiver who stands on the edge glancing over. A mailbox affords mailing a letter for someone sending a letter. The intentional act of mailing is the relationship between the affordance and the behavior of mailing. Each necessarily imply each other. Mailing is only possible with a mailbox that affords sending a letter, of course also implicating an organism for whom sending correspondence is a possibility. And sending a letter via the mailbox is only possible if mailing is a behavior that's possible. Thus, the mailbox affords mailing a letter because I can mail a letter and I know how to mail a letter. Mailing a letter is made possible because of the mailbox. Both of these, that is the affordance and the behavior, are part of the intentional act of having something to share, to pass on, to send to someone else. Said another way, if I want to send a letter to someone, I need to both mail that letter and have a mailbox that affords mailing. The intentional act is accomplished with the mutual relational interdependence between an affordance and a behavior. For the phenomenologist, I do not have access to the objects outside of my involvement with them. The encounter is what makes affordances possible, not their existence as invariant in the objects themselves. And this is not a return to a dualism between a subject and object. Person and world are inextricably linked. You never have one without the other. Gibson advocates for the relational quality of affordances, but he fails to take this one step further, that is, acknowledging the relational unity with a behavioral act. The behavior of sitting together with the affordance of a chair unite to complete the intentional goal-directed act. So let's take a closer look at the intentional act. An affordance and a behavior unite, comprising the intentional act. To consider each independently would be to ignore their relational mutuality, their interdependence. Having one necessarily implies the other. An intentional act, just like affordances, are not mental acts or mental schemata. They do not exist in the individual or reside inside. Intentional acts are situated Every act is embedded in a context. If I want to take a walk, walking is made possible by the situation or context. The surface I walk upon must afford walking. It must support my steps. Quicksand or water don't. Walking will not be realized in those locations. This intentional act of walking is enacted in the world. The intentional act is possibilized out of the world and does not exist as a mental representation. Another example, to sit is to both perceive a surface that will afford sitting and to bodily know one's dimensions. A doll-sized chair won't do. My body won't fit. The intentional goal of sitting is accomplished, is made manifest as a situated act with the joint meeting of affordances and bodily behavior. Sitting is accomplished by both my body and the object that affords sitting. So the possibilities afforded by surfaces and an organism's intentions imply each other. A chair might afford sitting, as we've discussed, or afford standing, but these are only realized by the person's intentions. Is the goal to sit or to stand? The chair offers these possibilities, which are realized, enacted by one's body. In a bare room with no furniture that's standing room only, there is no possibility of sitting. The intentional act cannot be accomplished. Even in a room with chairs, sitting may not be a possibility as the chair does not afford sitting to a person with no intention of enacting it.
Affordances are united with behaviors in the intentional act. One implies the other. Gibson is arguing that affordances are still there with or without the animal perceiver, seemingly neglecting how affordances point to both outside themselves, not just to the animal and object meeting out into the world, but the intentional goal-directed behavior that the affordance implies and makes possible. Yet, in his own description of a cliff that affords falling, and the studies that test if animals and infants possess the ability to see this cliff ledge by placing a plexiglass cover over the visual cliff, for an animal that does not sense by sight, say a sightless animal, the cliff is not there. The world appears, is manifest, is perceived by our senses. Intentional acts are possible with affordances and behaviors. Behaviors imply affordances, and affordances imply behaviors. Now, the independence of affordances from perceivers is an attempt by Gibson to ensure that mentalistic constructs that he has so strenuously tried to avoid are not suddenly added back into his theory. Gibson argues that perceivers picking up information that is already contained in the ambient array in optical light is a way to ensure that there's no mental concept or construct that's added into his understanding here. Thus, Gibson has been called a direct realist. We pick up, that is, we perceive the environment directly. It's not mediated by consciousness or mental representations or mental structures. The information is there ready for us to perceive it. In other words, we, as perceiving organisms, aren't adding anything there. We're simply picking it up. This seems to run counter to his insistence that affordances are relational, that a perceiving organism is necessary. Gibson can't see that one's intentional act, that is, what one is up to at any given moment, what one is doing or can't do for that matter, is tied up with one's generation of the perceptual world. Despite Gibson's relational aspect of affordances, he cannot and will not add in a mental component. He is blinded by his attempts to avoid dualism, that he fails to see how an organism not just participates, but creates their experiences. The intentionality of an organism is not a mental or internal component. It is a stance before a world. We do not blindly re react to the world, nor do we have thoughts in a disembodied, worldless mind. Meaning emerges out of an ongoing exchange between person and world. Meaning is neither in a world that exists independent of us, nor is it constructed by a mind. Intentional acts, our behavior, arises from our engagement with the world. There's a curious passage towards the end of the article where Gibson discusses the synthesis or lack thereof between the senses. Gibson's statement that we don't taste with our eyes. Ask yourself, is this correct? Why do ads spend so much money making the food look absolutely perfect? Can a juicy hamburger look delicious? Can we taste with our eyes? What about hearing the sizzling on the grill or smelling a delicious burger? Do we taste with our tongue alone? Most of the articles we will read this semester explore how sensory perceptions relate to each other. And as we read these articles, consider Gibson's claim. Is this sensory information already there for our taking? We're simply picking it up. Or is there a synthetic mixing, if you will, when we encounter the world? Your reflection this week asks you to pick a perceived object and to describe the multiple affordances that it offers. Given that every affordance implies both the object and organism, be sure to couch your affordances in light of the perceiving organism. For instance, you can consider how age and maturation play a role. 
A box might afford different things for a child compared to an adult, for example. Being taller also affords different possibilities. Social contexts can shape and change these affordances as well, being injured or sick or other considerations. Now, as you describe these affordances from the perspective of Gibson, also elaborate on the behaviors that co-occur. For example, stairs afford locomotion, but only if one can walk. The intentional act of getting to the second floor is accomplished by the affordances offered by stairs. In this case, the ability to move from the first floor to the second floor and one's behavior of climbing said stairs. Breaking one's leg means that one is not able to climb those stairs. The stairs no longer afford locomotion. They present an obstacle. Stairs only afford moving from one floor to another for someone with the ability to climb them, which accomplishes the goal of getting to the second floor. Affordances are realized only in relation to an intentional act that an organism can enact, that is, carry out or perform. So as you discuss the affordances, consider the projects, goals, and motives that the organism might be up to such that these affordances are made manifest, that is, possibilitized. Affordances are one part of the intentional act and thus, me, and thus must be understood in relationship with what an organism can and knows how to do. Consider Gibson's position in light of Neiser's claim that perception is an ongoing activity that transforms the world, not merely informing us of the world. How do these intentional acts exemplify Neiser's claim? What did Gibson overlook in his theory of affordances? This reflection is due on the 31st of January. It's the first of six reflections. You have the option of choosing four of these six to complete this semester.